Welcome to Optimal Play. I'm Brandon. I'm Steven. And it is with a little bit of a heavy heart that I say that we're here to review the Edge of the Earth player cards for Arkham Horror the Card Game. Uh, the reason for that is that we still don't actually have the cards. I think they're stuck on the Edge of the Earth. Yeah, they might be. For, for all we know, they're stuck somewhere, presumably on the Earth. Hopefully. We can't verify that. Uh, we like to have the cards in hand, and we like to put out the reviews around the time that, at least for us, these release were in the U.S., um, but the U.S. seems to be months behind the rest of the world right now, and we're kind of falling behind the zeitgeist, and it's been getting us down on the game a little bit? Is that That's that's at least true for me. I've been kind of playing less Arkham because everyone else is talking about the new cards, and I'm not... Yeah, I haven't, I haven't played too much the last couple of months. Yeah. It's definitely awkward, like, do I... You know, I like playing physically, but you can't play physically with the new cards. Right. Also, even digitally, like, I prefer not to play with them before you preview them. So. Yeah, exactly. Same. So, uh, and I've been doing the standalone videos with, um, with uh, Casey and Kyle, where we play standalone decks every time. And we, we do that on Tabletop Simulator on Twitch. Uh, and those two have been ragging, mostly Casey, hi Casey, have been ragging me about, like, when can I use the new cards? <laughs> like, just because you don't want to play with them, I don't, I can't play them. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's time to rip off the Band-Aid, compromise our morals, and uh, review off of our screens. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you've been living under a rock, the Edge of the Earth cycle is a lot different than, than the previous ones. We're getting all the player cards at once. Well, I mean, it's yet to be seen that we will get them, but <laughs> they, they have been packaged <laughs> all into one box, an entire cycle's worth of cards, and seemingly maybe even... I don't know, it seems to me like it is more cards than normally even come in a deluxe box and six-pack cycle. I haven't run the numbers, but it's a lot of cards. Yeah, I don't know how many cards. So. Uh, me neither. Um, but so we'll be doing a series of videos, taking our first looks at them. In the past, for like the Innsmouth box, I know we put them out like every day for a week. I think I'm going to space them out because it's a year until we get more <laughs> of these, right? So uh, if you if you enjoy this uh, this talk through of we're looking at the investigators today, um, subscribe to the channel. It'll probably be a few weeks um, and every couple weeks or so we'll put out the next one uh, so that there's always a, there's, there's always some Arkham talk kind of throughout the year, even though this new model means that the actual releases are far less often. Um, before we dive in, any like hopes, expectations for the Edge of the Earth box, anything like that? It's been so long since we previewed the cards, I forget the stuff that I was, like, excited about. Right. Like, I'm sure there were things where I was like, oh, I hope this is a theme, but I don't actually remember. Yeah, I, I think, so So I know, and we'll get to them several videos from now, I know that there are lots of multicolor, like, gold cards in the mm -hmm. box, which uh, I hate, but we'll get to that. <laughs> it seemed, from what I remember from the previews, it seems like it leans more into that being a theme than they were in the past, where there are cards that care about how many different classes you have in your tableau or something like that. Um, outside of that, I'm not aware of any new keywords or anything in this box. I think it's just a fairly kind of fundamental set of cards. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't, yeah, I don't really know what to expect either. Um, I know, I think, it seems like all the investigators are going to be Norman style, which... Right. I like Norman, so. Yeah, Norman, who came out as a promo in a book years ago, is finally in this box and has this deck building rules structure where he starts as a seeker and can only add level up mystic cards. Yeah. And we also looked at Daniela because FFG gave us a preview um, a month or two ago and she was the same way. So yeah, I think that they're all like that, which is part of why we're looking at the investigators as a group now, so that when we're looking at the player cards class by class, we can know who the heck can even play them. Yeah. Um, all right, with that, uh, we are going, because it is the order of the file names, uh, we're going alphabetically. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> is this, I want to give us Bob Jenkins? Yeah, he is the salesman. Um, he is drinking, I think, a whiskey. Um, yeah, so we cheers, to, cheers we, to Bob. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we chose the wrong beverage today, but it is noon, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's got two will, four books, three fists, and three agility. He's an entrepreneur, and at any time, an investigator at your location may reveal to you the item assets in their hand. Um, oh. So it's other investigators. Okay. Um, you may take an additional action during your turn, uh, which can only be used to play an item asset from the hand <laughs> of an investigator at your location under their control. Okay, so you spend your action to play their item. Hmm. Uh, both investigators may spend resources to pay its cost. 
And there's an Elder Sign, plus one for each item asset you control, six mm -hmm. health, and eight uh, sanity. Okay, so it's a boring it's a boring plus X auto um, Elder Sign, yeah. but uh, I would say the rest of him is not boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is, it's funny that they have a rule about an investigator can reveal item assets, because it's always been kind of a, how what does your group handle table talk thing anyway, that, yeah. that you would not talk about your hand. Um, but I guess this says like, no matter where your group has landed on table on talking about your hands, like go ahead and talk about <laughs> yeah, yeah. with Bob. Uh, so that that makes sense. Um, I mean, this seems. I don't know. It's weird. I'm. I'm. You know. Can, can we look at his deck building? I assume that he becomes a rogue, so that he has yeah. Money, right. Well, also, I was thinking the ability to use your actions to benefit other people helps a lot with rogue cards. Oh, because interesting. They're the ones who have all the extra actions. Yeah, that's true. So, Although he gets an extra one for that purpose anyway. Right, he takes an, an additional oh. action to play an item. Yeah, um, okay, that's true. Let's double check the backside of his card here. Uh, he's got a deck size of 30, and then, yes, survivor cards level 0, rogue cards level 1 through 5, um, neutral cards 0 through 5. Oh, right, and up to 5 rogue cards level 0. I kind of forgot that they have, yeah. they can splash at level 0 yeah. their, their secondary class. Um, or it's my, maybe even feels more like their primary class, like a level that Bob is probably going to have more, or, or at least care more about his rogue cards than mm -hmm. his survivor cards um and it looks like his his uh he's got a standard one signature one weakness and a, a basic weakness we'll we'll look at those in a second um yeah this is really hard to evaluate like i have a couple couple thoughts your the rest of your team needs to build around this right like yes everyone has some items but you're probably going to run more items if you know you have bob on your team mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, because he's only really, he really only has an ability when there's an item to play. He doesn't yeah. do anything else any other. I time. mean, he can play his own items too with the additional. Yes, items, but... Um, but he doesn't. Wait. Oh, okay. He gets an extra action to play his own items, right? Yeah. Because he's an investigator. Okay. Okay. So it doesn't have to be someone else's item to get the additional action. Um, and then both investigators may spend resources. So that means they could like an item that costs four, you could pay two and two for? Is that how you yes. interpret that? That's interesting. But I, I mean, think, I assume you would want to play a lot of rogue money cards mm -hmm. and pay the majority of your, because I, I assume it's a support thing. So you Agreed. are trying to save actions and money from your teammates. Agreed, yeah. You, you'd you be wanting to run a lot of economy in your deck and then your team members can focus less on that and get get straight to the investigation and the slaying, uh, because you're handling that for them. Um, I like it. This is totally. I'm I'm very. I really enjoy a support play style. Like mm -hmm. I, I like to be the support player. So this seems right up my alley. Um, I guess lastly, what do you make of his stats? I guess his to the extent that like they don't really play into his ability at all. Mm -hmm. But like, would you build him to kind of secondarily also get clues because he has. Intellect as his highest stat? Yeah, I think it's a good stat line. Two will is... Will is great as your lowest stat, because you can just take lots of items that can soak uh, Mythos effects. True. Um, mm -hmm. And just don't worry about passing Mythos tests. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, Intellect is probably, like, the best, like, kind of secondary thing for a support character to do. Um, like we see that with like Carolyn who's kind of a support character, but when she's not supporting, she investigates. Right. Um, so yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing I would say might be a little better is like he, if he had a little bit higher, uh, fight and lower evade or vice versa, it'd be mm -hmm. like a little bit clearer how he should handle enemies if he does happen to get one. Whereas this is kind of like, yeah, he's mediocre. E either way yeah. I wish that he had access to, like, when I see his intellect and his ability, I think he would be great with seeker assets, like fingerprint kit, things that have a limited number of uses, and then you replace them, mm -hmm. and every, by running a lot of those items with... Well, old key ring. Uh, oh, that's true. Yes. Yes, yeah, Survivor does have a couple of those now. And flashlight, yeah. Yeah, I guess, you know, yeah, he might be bringing back the old flashlight. Uh, maybe there's a leveled up flashlight in this box, I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, the, the other part of the picture is always their signature card. Uh, what's his signature? It looks like an asset. Ooh, Shrewd Dealings. Uh, Two-cost asset with two books in a wild. It's a talent. Um, it's reduce the cost of each item asset you play by one. Wow. Ooh. That could be really, that could be like $15 over the course of a game. 
Um, and then reaction, when you play an item asset, play it under the control of any investigator or location. Ooh. Whoa. Oh, wow. That's wild. Oh, and then this flavor text is too real right now. You <laughs> say end of the world, I hear business opportunity. That is... Yeah, that's that's very <laughs> trail. Uh, that's that's uh that's that's too real. But um okay, so that really opens up his options. Let me I'm double checking his card because so yes, he is considering to be playing the card in other people's hands, which means if I'm Bob and I play a card from your hand, it gets this discount. Mm -hmm. Right? If I have shrewd dealings. And then also I can play it under my uh, my control. I think um, the way I read this, Bob decides who controls <laughs> it, right? Like, this doesn't actually say that you need their permission or anything. <laughs> yeah, well, his first ability does it require their permission. Which Yeah, that's true. I guess because uh, the, the, the investigators would have to reveal the items for you to like know you could play them, but then you can kind of unilaterally play them under, <laughs> under your own yeah. control. So if you're, if you're playing like... with a really trolley bob, just don't reveal any cards. <laughs> um, uh, so this turns him even more into someone that I think you'd have fun building around because Bob's on your team, right? Now what I said about he's great with those Seeker assets like might actually be achievable because your Seeker just runs a few extras so that Bob can play them. Yeah, it's it totally changes the dynamics of deck building for everyone else because it's yeah. like normally as a Seeker you probably pick do I want two fingerprint kit and one mag glass or do I want two mag glass and one fingerprint kit? Now it's like you you run both and probably two scroll of secrets as well. Yeah, you know? and like, it's cryptographic cipher. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like as much as you can fit. Almost. Same thing with your guardian. Like it, guardians maybe normally run five weapons or something. Um, now maybe they run seven or eight. Yeah, they just figure Bob's take some of them. Yeah, I mean, you can. I, I yeah, I really would love to play like a four player game where everyone's a different class and brings just like all the assets they can, all the items they can, at least from their class. I guess different classes like. Seekers and Guardians are big on items. Maybe other classes are more spells and talents. So, mm -hmm. so it, it, it varies how much they can contribute to kind of that. But to be able to then distribute them as needed for the scenario and as uh, letting you... Like the promise of the Guardian card teamwork has always been like, man, imagine that... <laughs> that uh, what am I saying? Imagine that investigator with that card that they can't normally get. That would be so cool. This feels like a way more reasonable and reliable way to make that happen to actually build around that... Mm -hmm. It sounds like a blast. I'm yeah. excited. Yeah. Um, I'm curious how his weakness is going to ruin it. So mm -hmm. <laughs> his weakness is greed. Uh, there's a, wow, a nice picture of a $5 bill in a suitcase. Okay. For some reason, seeing like real American money is like weird to me, but I guess this is, you know, set in real, <laughs> real America. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a flaw. It says, Revelation, take one horror. So take one horror, period. If you have... Ten or fewer resources take one additional horror. Five or fewer resources take an additional horror. And if you have exactly zero resources, take this is we're up to a total of four horror. <laughs> Worshipped by its own cult, one might say. Also a little re a little bit real there. Um, okay, how does this I change think, the way you play Bob? I think this is really mild. Like most yeah. most of the time, it's probably two horror, right? What, like, what were his? He has uh, okay. He has eight sanity. So if you think about good. this as like. Most of the time it's two horror, then this is one teddy bear, the church keepsake. Yeah. Like, yeah. that seems pretty mild to me compared to, like, a really good signature. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Like, if you're at seven resources, I, this is all obviously going to depend on context, how much horror you already have and stuff. But if I have seven resources, am I going to say, like, no, I'm not going to help you play that item because it's going to drop me below five and my weakness might get drawn and <laughs> do one more horror than it would yeah. have? Like, no, probably not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably not going to play around this too much other than, like you suggested, throwing a little bit of horror soak in your deck. And, hey, maybe that's Pete Sylvester. Although yeah. I guess he can't level up Pete, which hurts yeah. a little bit. Yeah, but still, like, yeah, you, you, you probably run a basic Pete. You probably run a couple of Cherish Keepsakes or... Yeah. You can even level them up to, what, the Elder Sign Amulets and stuff. And uh, Cherish Keepsakes maybe don't benefit from a discount, but if you have shrewd dealings and you have too much soak in your hand, just hand it out to other people. True. Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of cool, yeah. You really, like, you can't overdo it with these items now because you always have a backup, like, oh, if I draw my second copy and I don't need it, give it to someone else. Someone will be able to use it. Yeah. Super cool. Uh, I love them. Yep. Yeah. Um, Definitely looking forward to Bob.
And then next up is Daniela, who we've looked at before because we got to preview her. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a quick recap, uh, she has high willpower and high combat at 4 and 5 and low in the other stats. These are some of the more polarized stats, I think, mm -hmm. an investigator has had. Uh, interestingly, I hadn't realized that there were going to be others. She's also an entrepreneur. Oh. So maybe we'll see those sweet entrepreneur traded uh, <laughs> cards. I doubt it. But anyway, um, after an enemy attacks you, even if that attack was canceled, either deal one damage to that enemy or automatically evade it. And her Elder Sign effect is plus one. If you were attacked by an enemy this round, you automatically succeed instead. And uh, I, as I recall, yeah, she builds with level zero guardian cards and up to five survivor cards at level zero and then levels up with survivor cards. Um, I guess that since we've talked about this once before, want to give us like both her signatures, we'll just talk quickly about yeah. her. Yeah. So uh, she's got the mechanics wrench asset, two cost, two fists, one wild. Uh, as a fast action, you can exhaust it to make an enemy at your location attack you. Uh, and then for an action, you can fight, use this ability only against an enemy that has attacked you since the end of your last turn. You get plus two fight and plus one damage for this attack. So combos with her main ability. Mm -hmm. Basically, you can do three damage between her investigator ability and this ability. Right. At the cost of an attack. Um, and then her weakness, mob goons, 3-3-3, three, 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 hunter. Uh, enemies' attacks cannot be canceled, and damage and horror dealt by this enemy's attacks is treated as direct. So if you have lots of soak in your deck, yeah, not uh, as helpful. Yeah, it's, it's interesting... Uh... The weakness is interesting because it targets, it doesn't really target Daniela via like her own ability. It it, it uh, targets the things that it's like implied that she wants to do a lot yeah, of yeah. canceling attacks and soaking, right? <laughs> yeah, there's nothing to stop her from just like, killing it with like a regular weapon. Right, right. Um, so I think when we previewed her, we were a little lukewarm on her. I think even you more. So I was a little me. more lukewarm. Yeah. Me, yeah. Um, but we also played her because at the end of the weekend where we previewed uh, me, Kyle, and Case played a game where we played each of the cards that we previewed mm -hmm. in a deck. Um, she came across to me in that game as very strong. Mm. Uh, she, she was, like, the, the attacks, um, I'm trying to remember what scenario we played. I think it might have been extracurricular activity, which, so partly we were playing leveled up decks in extracurricular mm -hmm. activity. It was not that challenging a scenario. Um, but... Yeah, she just, just with a little bit of soak, like, did not have trouble with the amount of damage and horror mm -hmm. she was taking. And then being able to take out, like, yes, it was extracurricular activity because I killed at least three whippoorwills for zero actions each. That is pretty much. When normally whippoorwills are two actions at least because you have to engage and attack them. Um, just being able to provoke an attack from them and mm -hmm. then deal a damage to them killing them, like, it's amazing against one hit point enemies. Yeah. And then um, the mechanics wrench is just, it's great. It's, it's better than a machete, like, its attack is better than a machete's, uh, because it's plus two combat, plus one damage. And then the fact that the enemy has to attack you, like, you've also already done damage because of that. Yeah. So it's not even just all downside. Um, I don't know, I thought she was great, and I'm excited mm -hmm. to play more. Yeah, cool. Any other thoughts on Daniela? Um, no, I, um, yeah, I'm excited to see what kind of cards that they give us to combo with her. Yeah, yeah, so we'll be looking at the level zero guardian cards and the leveled up survivor cards for yeah. her. This is, it's it's very brain bending. It's gonna, <laughs> I, I feel like we're gonna do a lot of, as we're looking at the player cards, a lot of like, oh, Bob would be great with that card. Like, oh, wait, that's a level one survivor. Never mind. <laughs> I feel like that's going to happen. Um, all right, tell us about Lily. Yeah, Lily is, Lily Chen is the martial artist. Uh, three will, two book, four fist, and three agility. Um, she's chosen and warden. You begin sure. the game with each discipline in your deck uh, in play, unbroken side, face up. Okay, that's nonsense. Go on. <laughs> uh, chaos, uh, sign, um, plus two. After this test ends, flip a broken discipline you control to its unbroken side. Um, okay, you gotta love an investigator where nothing on it makes any sense. <laughs> I'm just imagining... Um, if you remember in Netrunner, there was Adam who started with his three directives. Like I, I'm sort of imagining something like that. Although those didn't have two sides. Um, uh, yes, I think that's a good comparison. And I recall her being previewed. Like I, I think I, I have an idea of what's going on here. Um, and in fact, let's look at the backside of her because this has a little bit more information. 
Yeah, so she is, starts as a mystic, only, uh, same thing, she can only have um, level zero, then guardian, uh, level Come, one to five. Becomes a guardian, okay. Um, plus five other guardian level zeros. Um, she starts with one burden of destiny for each discipline asset and one random basic weakness. Um, she can have no firearm assets. She's all martial arts. Oh, funny, yeah. And then at deck creation, choose a discipline asset to add to your deck. It is considered part of your deck building requirements. For every 15 experience you've earned in total, you may choose and add a different discipline asset to your deck. Okay, so she starts with one. Then as you level up, she adds more, but she mm -hmm. also adds more weaknesses. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, her discipline, I mean, we're, we're just going to have to get to those pretty quickly, I think. But her disciplines, yeah, it is like Adam's directives, right? Mm -hmm. Adam? Yeah, Adam. Yeah. Um, where you're choosing kind of a focus for your deck. What's interesting is that she, I guess, it, may you or must you? You must, no, wait. Uh, no, for every 15 you've earned, you may add another one. So you can eventually mm -hmm. get this complicated system of, yeah. of you know, directive equivalents, um, which seems, I don't know, let's, let's look ahead. Uh, we've got, so, so yeah, as, as I'm scrolling here, um, I, I have if, if essentially eight cards to look at here. That's because there's four double-sided cards. Um, so her first one is Discipline Alignment of Spirit. Uh, on its unbroken side, this is a Lily Chen deck only, and it's permanent. Okay, so you're adding these to your deck, but they're not actually shuffled into your deck. They're permanent cards. Uh, you get plus one willpower. As an action, you can take one direct damage to heal three horror, or take one direct horror to heal three damage, and then flip this asset over. And the other side of this asset is the broken side. It's the same art, but in black and white. Okay, I, I like it. Uh, as a reaction, after the round ends, if you took no damage or horror this round, flip this asset over to its unbroken side. Okay, so it has... So when it's unbroken, it gives you a stat boost, yeah. right? So, and, and flipping ahead a little bit. Okay, so each one is a different stat. Yeah. So that's that's probably the number one thing you're basing your decision for which discipline on is that stat, right? Mm. Yeah. And then it has this action ability. And since it's an action, it's like you may or may not ever use it. Uh, but you can convert basically three horror into one damage or vice versa and uh, flip the asset over. But then you lose your stat boost until you survive a round without getting hurt. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know. Let's look at some more. What's next? Uh, so the next one is quiescence. There's a quiescence of thought. Not a word I've ever seen. So Yes, I think they made, they made it up. <laughs> um, and uh, so this gives plus one book, and as an action, if you have fewer than five cards in your hand, draw cards until there are five in your hand, then flip this over. Ooh, that seems good. Mm -hmm. Right, that could draw up to five cards. Yep. Um, although from playing the Guardian, the Survivor card that draws you up to five, I feel like it's hard to get down to zero. True. But yeah. But yeah, it's, and then uh, the Broken Side, uh, reaction after the round ends, if your hand did not have two or more cards in it at any point in this round, flip this over to the unbroken. Oh, so you then have to spend all those cards that you drew. Hmm. After the round ends. Interesting. So you, then you need to get down to zero to get this back. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, so what does this mean? You would, so it's funny. I, I just scrolled back and checked. She has two intellect. So like you're unlikely to, the, the, to yeah, the like, go boost. out of your way to go get her to three. And then do what with that? Like, nothing, really. Yeah, yeah. The, so, the permanent seems kind of useless here. Yeah. Um, the ability so, means, so like... It, it says to me you'd run a lot of events. Because you're more likely to just be able to throw those out of your hand, multiple of them per round. And even potentially a lot of fast or reactive events, like treachery cancels. Oh, uh, right? you know what would be great is the Guardian one-cost event that plays three assets. Oh, uh, ever vigilant. That's right. That would work fantastically with this. Yeah, they can't be firearms, but <laughs> as long as she's got enough other uh, other assets in her deck. Oh. Um, but yeah, so basically, what would have to happen is you have to get down to like, let's say, two or less cards, then use this to drop to five, then get back down to two or less cards, then two, flip it two back. Two less over. than two. You have to be at zero or one for the entire round. True, because so, you're so you draw essentially. Somewhere. 
Yeah, since you're going to draw in the upkeep, you almost need to get your hand down to zero and then draw one card in the upkeep and not draw any cards that following round. And then this flips back over. Well, I mean, you can play cards during your turn. So you can... Yeah, but you have... To, well, okay, yeah, you could play that one card and draw yeah. again. Yeah. But you can't ever have a second card in your hand. Like, that yeah. is that is limiting. Yeah. Uh, well, also, think... lots of skill cards, isn't it? Yeah. Way. Like... I think this one's more interesting. It's, it like... Yeah, it's more interesting. I feel like it is more of a build around than the one that just manages horror and damage. Yeah. But or maybe it's just the um, one that you take when you get forty five experience. <laughs> true. Yeah, but it's it also yeah it seems like the, much harder to flip over. Um, I almost I almost look at this as like if you have this. I I almost look at its action ability as like a once per game ability, mm -hmm. and you're just not going to bend over backwards to get it to flip back. That's over. a good point. It right? may not be worth like because what are you using that intellect for? Probably nothing. Yeah, I think this is just a you would only a be doing it ability. in order yeah. to use the ability again, right? But that requires you like well, I guess because it flips over your two, so you can use it pretty much immediately. Yeah, I mean, there's something interesting to that flow of the one side of this fills up your hand and then as soon as it's empty it flips again and you can fill up your hand again and really play a lot of cards that way mm -hmm. uh also draw make sure you're drawing all your weaknesses <laughs> really often too but yeah there's something there i'm really curious what people will do with it mm -hmm. uh but it doesn't it's not an obvious fit for sure um all right her third discipline man there's a lot going on here is prescience of fate you get plus one combat, and since she had four combat to start with, right, that's pretty exciting, and she's get play, got guardian cards. Um, and then uh, you get, as an action ability, you get plus five skill value for the next skill test you perform this turn. After that skill test ends, flip this asset over. Um, okay, and then on the back side, it loses its stat boost, and after the round ends, if you performed no skill tests this round, flip it over to its unbroken side. Hmm. This one feels like the best one so far because of the combat boost, I think. Because Lily is going to be using her combat, probably. And then I think I would almost, I would try to, unless I'm really desperate, not use this ability. And just keep that boost. Yeah. <laughs> I also think, I mean, getting this one back is not that bad. I mean, like, if there's going to be a lull in the action, um, it's not too hard to not take a skill test. Uh, although... What does yeah. suck is it's a little bit unpredictable because you can't control whether the mythos phase gives you a skill test. Yeah, it has to unless be unless you have a ward of protection the whole round, right? Yeah, so it's hard to avoid sometimes um, the, taking them. The main thing with the the reason I wouldn't flip this too often is just you're spending then two actions to do the test, and um, so it would have to be a oh. pretty important test. Yeah, okay, so it does say the action does not provoke attacks of opportunity, uh, so you can use it to, like, make sure you're going to get a good attack in, but you're right that in spending two actions, that's that's steep. Yeah. That's that's a price. Yeah, I think you're mostly... I'm, I'm starting to think almost all of these action abilities are once-per-game things, mm -hmm. because they're, spending an action is already a decent cost, and so is losing that stat, and then if you look at it as like jumping through hoops to flip back over, that's even more of a cost kind of just following the ability. Mm -hmm. I think you just ignore that cost and complete the game <laughs> with it on its broken side. Um, we haven't looked at what her, her weakness does yet, so we'll see if you might regret like having all your, your uh, disciplines broken. But uh, all right, one more discipline to look at first. Uh, balance of body. Uh, you get plus one agility and then action. One at a time, take up to three different fight or evade actions. Flip this asset over. This action does not provoke the tax opportunity. Oh, well, this seems good. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of the reverse of the previous one. Whereas the first one is like, I'm going to spend two actions to make sure I get this yeah. fight off. What was her agility? Her agility was three, so this gets it to four. Okay, that's something. Um, but yeah, and this is because they're fight actions. That means you can use your shotgun three times. She like, can't use firearms, but she could use her uh, machete three times. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or whatever it is. Yeah. Enchanted Blade. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this is the best one, probably. Although, yeah, it's it's still, again, even though she has better agility than Intellect, it doesn't, agility doesn't do much with Mystic or Guardian cards. So I still look at the stat boost as most likely not mm -hmm. exciting. Yeah. Uh, the action sure is, though. Oh, and what happens? Did we look at the back yet? Uh, so the back, after the round ends, if no enemies were at the same location as you at any point in this round, flip this over to some broken. 
That's pretty easy. Oh, yeah. So you can use this yeah. for the three attacks a lot. Like, just kill, kill everything. Kill, kill everything with those three. Or evade them and move away. And you're good. That's I think I think this this one, aside from its stat boost being the, not an interesting stat boost, seems like the best mm -hmm. discipline yeah. <laughs> for its ability and the ease of flipping it back over. <laughs> yeah. um, and then her weakness, which... Um, this is the downside of looking at this digitally. I don't know this for a fact, but I assume that there are four of these because you're supposed to take one per yeah. discipline. So I assume there's four in the box. Uh, Burden of Destiny is a flaw. You must either... And so this is not permanent. This will get shuffled into your deck, unlike the disciplines. Uh, when you draw it, you must either flip a discipline you control to its broken side. It cannot flip back this round or take one damage and one horror. How can I save them if I cannot save myself? If I can't even save myself. Um... That doesn't seem too bad. Yeah, and this right? is actually um, another reason why, as one of your early disciplines, you probably want to pick one of the ones that's easy to flip back over. Yeah, so you can keep hitting it with the burdens. Exactly. Yeah. So, like, probably don't pick the draw five one as, yeah. like, the first one, because then, you know, if you if it, fl it gets flipped with this, it's quite difficult to flip that one back over. Right. And so, so this is, in a roundabout way, this is a downside. I was, I was wondering if there would, if the weakness would create a downside to t treating your disciplines as a once per game ability and leaving them face down. Mm -hmm. This, the downside is that this forces you to choose another one that you would have rather not like or take a damage. And horror. Um, yeah, but it does have that 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 option of a damage and horror, which yeah, that doesn't seem that bad. Yeah. Just just have Bob buy you soak items, right? <laughs> <laughs> um Okay, she's certainly hard to grok. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what kind of decks you're gonna build with Lily. Um But I, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited to see. I feel like because of the different disciplines, she has more different strategies than than most investigators. Yeah. So like I'm instantly thinking like, let's say you take the alignment of spirit for plus one will. You could actually kind of keep her as a mystic for a while, you know, because she then now has four will. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe then you load up with like two shriveling, two right of seeking, um, or uh, the other one, the, the permanent right of seeking. Um, what is uh, it called? Six cents. Six cents, yeah. Um, maybe you keep her as a mystic for a while, you know? Or but yeah. if you start with like the fight one, you might just like get out of mystic as soon as possible. Right, yeah. Okay, I think that's a good way of looking at it. It's like you'd be a mystic for a while. Because you just can't take those, you can't take Shriveling 2 or, or any of those level up spells, eventually you're going to be like, this isn't cutting it anymore. So you gotta, you'll have to start relying on Guardian cards to, to do the things that you were doing with those spells, right? Which is... So I think even that, though, pushes you towards combat because that's what Guardian cards are good at. But if you know that, like, oh, at the time that I pick the fancy weapons i'm gonna have 15 xp and so i'll be able yeah. to take the fight one true like i think that does give you the option if you want to start with the will one yeah i think with um with the combination of mystic and guardian cards you could be pretty well-rounded too and run like a not that i think she's a great card but like an alice luxley or, or one of those cards that like plays into uh clues and fighting maybe you're not sold okay <laughs> <laughs> the plus one book as we discovered probably not that useful um, yeah, but you don't, oh, oh, I see what you're saying, because that's what, that's the stat from Alice. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Although if you also have the discipline, all of a sudden she's at four, that's a thing. That's, 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 uh, Bob just hands her a flashlight and she's good to go. <laughs> all right, Monterey Jack is our rogue, supposedly. He has a green, uh, he has a green card. Just looking ahead, oh, he's going to be mostly yellow cards. Um, one willpower, so, okay, he is a rogue. Uh, four intellect, two combat, five agility. He's a wayfarer. At the end of your turn, if you started this round one location away from your current location, either gain one resource or draw one card. If you started the round two or more locations away, do both instead. Mm. Oh, so he likes to stay moving. So he's a lot like Ursula yeah. <laughs> in some ways. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then his Elder Sign effect, plus one, if you started this round one or more locations away from your current location, gain one resource or draw one card. Oh, it's like trigger your mm -hmm. ability again. Um, 
And you forgot the most important thing about Monterey Jack, which is that uh, if he's in your party in Forgotten Age, he starts as the expedition leader. Yes. We've, we've been waiting for years. Yeah, for that, that right. That campaign name dropped him years, literally years ago. Uh, funny. <laughs> he's finally here. Um, that does make me want to play some, uh, some Forgotten Age when I try him out, <laughs> for yep. sure. Uh, okay, and then, yeah, so his... his Deck building is level zero row cards, one through five seeker cards, five seeker cards, uh, level zero, and it looks like he has a signature and a weakness, as you'd expect. Uh, what, what, how do you like him? Uh, it's, uh, let's see. So he's going to, he likes to investigate, but he really likes to just evade and move. So mm -hmm. probably also really good in solo, like just like a, oh, I just evade all the enemies, move around, get clues. Yeah, and who cares that there's 15 enemies piled up? Yeah, and in a real way, there's more movement in solo because there's, like, one clue lo per yeah. location. So you're not sitting in four players. You're going to send someone to a location to spend three rounds getting those clues. Doesn't happen in uh, in solo. Interesting, yeah. In, in a, uh, I feel like we've been increasingly, and especially with cards like Bob, seeing a, a more and more multiplayer focus in the designs, which I like because that's how I don't play this solo very much. Um but yeah, I can see that here. This is a great solo investigator. All in all, like it kind of, kind of seems like weaker Ursula to me, <laughs> right? Like I feel like Ursula getting an a free investigate action, which then she can combo with any number of seeker investigate cards, is stronger than getting a free resource or a free card draw, right? And yes, if he moves twice, he gets to do both, and so then that's like maybe tilting towards him getting having the better action economy, but. I don't know, seems like weaker Ursula. Mm -hmm. Ursula is very strong, so not every investigator has to be as strong as Ursula, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, what's his asset? Uh, it's a trusty bullwhip. It's a two-cost asset, two agility and a wild, item, weapon, and melee, uh, Ooh, fast, fast. Monterey Jack deck only. Now, does deck only mean that Bob can't play it, or is it just it can't Ooh, be in Bob's deck? That's a great question. Can Bob hand this to another investigator? I don't know the answer to that. Maybe someone can uh, comment on this video and let us know. That's a great question. Um, as an action, you can fight, um, and this uses agility instead of combat. If this attack succeeds, you may exhaust Trusty Bullwhip to either automatically evade the attacked enemy or deal plus one damage for this attack. So hmm. this is how I was thinking, like, man, for an Indiana Jones type, he doesn't, he's not good at fighting. But I guess that's how he does it. <laughs> yeah, and I lost track of this comment at one point. It was in my mind. It never came out of my mouth, I don't think. But it's funny that in his art, he's holding a gun. When yeah. He has two combat, right? Uh, but, yeah. So this does make him really just a pretty good enemy manager. <laughs> because depending on the situation, he can either do extra damage or evade. Like, it's funny. If you choose this to automatically evade, then all that this really... So this, I guess this did two things. It did one damage in addition to evading. And it was almost oh, like an, it was almost like an evasion against the enemy's fight stat instead of their mm, evade stat, true. right? Yeah. Because you're still testing agility, so that's why I say like it's yeah. actually kind of similar to just evading, but it's it's against their different stat. Um, so it definitely opens up kind of a lot of options, and it kind of yeah. To to me, I think that's the real that's the real upside of this here is like that he's still very good at evading enemies, but he can do it against whichever of their stats is easier. Yeah. <laughs> Once he has his bullwhip. Uh, and I think that's pretty strong. Hmm. Yeah. It also reminds me of that scene in Indiana Jones where the guy does the like crazy, like whip motion. And then Indiana Jones just takes out his gun and shoots him. <laughs> so I, I think the real Indiana Jones would just shoot Monterey Jack. <laughs> it wouldn't be much of a competition. You're not wrong. <laughs> That's funny. Even though Monterey Jack is an, is a pretty overt Indiana Jones reference, right? <laughs> Everything about him screams Indiana Jones. Um, his weakness is buried secrets. Uh, it's a treachery, but when uh, when you draw it, you put it into play in your threat area. If your location can be investigated, you cannot move except by scenario card effects. Okay, so you cannot move except, mm -hmm. but the scenario can force you to move. Uh, as an action, investigate. If you succeed, instead of discovering clues, discard buried secrets. If you fail, you may take two horror to shuffle it into your deck. Oh, and how is his... Uh... Okay, he has low sanity, six, but he's good at investigating at four. Mm -hmm. um 
Hmm. This is this is interesting. There, hmm, this, yeah. Like, There's a lot going on here. A lot of the <laughs> right. times, it's not going to be that bad. Like, if it's on a three shot, three shroud or lower location, this is pretty minor. Yeah. Um, I suspect the reason that they put that if you fail in there is because, like, if you did somehow get this on, like, a six shroud location or something, yeah. like, giving you, like, a safety yeah. valve to, like, shuffle it back in and hopefully draw it again on a lower right. shroud location. Well, I am actually, I'm trying to think, I feel like it would be kind of unprecedented if it required him to pass a test, right? Like, I don't think weaknesses really require you to pass a test, ever. So, what? Well, right? I mean, enemies I mean, en sort enemies of, sort of. Like... Yeah, but there's like, you have a lot of options for how to handle them, your other players can help, all that stuff. Um, yeah, so, so like, Frozen in Fear is not, is a treachery design that really we haven't seen kind of used on weaknesses, and so it makes sense to me that this has, has that alternate option. Um, with his horror not very high and it shuffling back into his deck, I, and him being a, a you know, quasi-seeker who is probably going to have some card draw mm -hmm. on his deck because seeker cards do a lot of that, um, and his an, own ability <laughs> card draws cards, yeah, I don't think you want to shuffle this back into your deck, though. I think that sounds rough. <laughs> yeah, and it's important to note, if you fail, you don't have to shuffle back into your deck. You can also just take a second action. Oh, you could just try again. again. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so I it's, think it, it's not going to kill you if you try and fail. It affects your deck building because I think he wants Magglass now because mm. that's a passive boost to investigate. Yeah. Whereas let's say you're like, I'm going to do lockpicks instead. You can't actually use lockpicks on Buried Secret. Like they're both investigate actions. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. You can't combine this with cards that are actions, basically. Um, hmm. Okay, cool. I, I think it, I think it's a, a unique design. I like a lot. Mm -hmm. I... Uh, I don't know how, what, like, I don't know. He's no Tony, who's probably my favorite rogue. Maybe that's just because I like guardians and I like mm -hmm. killing enemies. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm super sold on Monterey Check, but it's cool. It's, it's a unique design for sure. Yeah, so let's see. So he'll be able to draw a lot of cards and probably have a lot of actions because, like, rogue level zero, you can still get Leo. Um, but you're not doing all the stuff from, like, you're not getting the credit from Milan, um, or, yeah. you know. And then, I will, we haven't talked too much about him being a Seeker. Seekers also are great at movement, so, like, there's that synergy there with his ability, right? Once he gets Pathfinder, yeah. he can trigger this f without even having to take a move action. Um, but, yeah, I don't know, like, hmm. all the moving around, nothing about this screams, like, you're kind of the team's clue-getter. <laughs> because that usually require at least in multiplayer you want to stay in one spot and kind of kind of get get a lot of clues i don't know i'm I'm very confused about what to actually do with this even though i think it's unique and interesting mm -hmm. hmm. i mean i guess so you can take five level zero seeker so you could take milan if you wanted um there's also as you level up there is um oh you know what would be really good with him is the one where when you move to a new place you search nine for uh like a relic um oh that's well that's another ally that's wit and green right? yeah wit yeah. and green mm -hmm. um and th there is a level two version of that that's pretty good so like maybe that's his main ally yeah to turn her ability on you have to have a tome or relic which yeah. is a, a weird for him like well i mean i guess he's a seeker maybe he'll have tomes i don't see him running a lot of it's using his hand slots on tomes um especially when his signature asset is a fight hand slide right like he's not gonna just have a whole bunch of books yeah but um, there, there's movement tomes there's scroll of secrets is yeah. always good that's um, literally always good yeah <laughs> so hmm. that might be a good one for him okay i could i, I certainly will admit i could be un underrating him but um i rate him low <laughs> and then uh have we been through four now yeah so our last yep. one is norman right yep uh i lost track of who who read monterey but uh, I, go ahead give us norman all right He's the Astronomer. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got four will, five books, two fist, and one agility. He's Miskatonic. Play with the top card of your deck revealed. Um, which, was there another effect similar to that? I guess... Mm -hmm. Joe with the Insight deck, I guess, is the closest. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and then once per round, you may play the top card of your deck as if in your hand at minus one resource cost. So it's very similar to Joe, yeah. except this is minus one instead of minus two. Uh, forced after a weakness is revealed while on top of your deck, draw it. And then Elder Sign Effect plus X. Uh, and then you may swap the top card of your deck with a card in your hand. X is the resource card of the top card of your deck. Um, it's And I don't know whether that X changes based on if you do the swap or not. Um... Oh, interesting. Uh, I don't know either <laughs> whether that whether that X is locked in before or after you. I, I would think it, it's a more interesting effect if it looks at the card that you after the swap. Mm -hmm. um, all in all, generally, elder sign effects with a plus anything is like yeah, you probably pass. Like, yeah, there's, there's yeah. not much else to it. It's a pretty the, the the X is actually not the interesting part here. It's being able to swap. Yeah, if there's some card cards, you want to play at minus one cost. Yeah, um, you put it. Uh, for example, um, skill cards on top of the deck are not that useful. So if there's a skill card on top of the deck, take it off, put an asset there, and then play it at minus one. Uh, yes and no. Um, he can play the top of the skill card from the top of his deck when he takes a skill test. I don't know right? if he can. Isn't that committing a card? Not oh, do you card? not play skill cards? You, you, you commit them and that's not playing? I guess, oh. Yeah. So I think if you have a skill card... Okay. You want okay. to get it off of the deck. So he's probably playing very few skill cards for that reason, if he can avoid it. Yeah, or right. playing cards that change what's on top of your deck is another thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I assume probably his signatures have to do with that. I don't know that there's that much else that... Well, well like, I mean, Eureka, I Eureka's a skill card, oh. but having it in your deck you're allows saying, like, you to change what's it, on top of the deck. It, it, True. Oh, it okay. That's interesting. So things like Old Book of Lore that let you at will search and yeah. shuffle your deck are recontextualized with Norman because it gives you a new top card. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Okay. And then he and I think we knew this because he's been out in the wild as a as a as a novella promo investigator for a long time. He builds with level zero seeker cards, level uh, up to five level zero mystic cards, but then levels up into mystic with level one through five only in mystic. Um. He's got good willpower and good intellect, so I feel like more than most investigators, it's like very clear that like there's going to be a lot of cards in both classes that are very good for him, right? Yeah. So I have played. I have played Norman, and mm -hmm. yeah, he definitely plays a lot of seeker cards. Like I think, um, you want to play Mad Glass or Fingerprint Kit, something like that. Um, you do. I I did like playing some skill cards because I think Eureka and Deduction are so strong. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the advantages of the level zero seeker class is just like those are really good level zero cards. Um, you can play someone like a Milan if you want. Um, and I mean, yeah, I think I think his ability. Right, like I think he's probably great. We haven't looked ahead to his signatures yet, and those will be different than in his promo form. Uh, but uh, yeah, essentially saying you have an extra card in your hand that's one cheaper and has the implied text like when you play this, draw a card, right? Because then the next card is considered to be in your hand. Yeah, um, that seems really strong. Because <laughs> if you do that every round, you're saving a resource and kind of getting an extra card draw. Yeah, um, and that seems almost more likely that you're going to trigger that and get that two, almost two actions worth of benefit. Like, more often than you're going to with Monterey Jack, mm -hmm. get those two actions worth of benefit. Uh, the one, it seems great. Yeah, I mean, the one counterpoint is, so Joe is very similar and also gets you a draw and two resources. Oh, interesting. With his Insight deck, it does work quite similar. But yeah. there is, um, there's less ability, first of all, you have less control over what cards can be in there. So, like, with... Joe, you have to have lots of insights in your deck. So mm -hmm. it's less flexible deck building wise. Um, it's also less flat, like there's a lot of ways to manipulate what's on top of the deck. Um, you can even just yeah. draw a card. Like if you, right. for an action, if there's a skill card on top of your deck or something, you can draw a card and maybe you'll get an asset, you know? True. Joe, yeah. um, if you have logical reasoning on top of your insight deck and no one's taken any horror yet, there's nothing you can do about that. Right. Like, it's yeah. just a waste. Yeah, there's no way that you can see what's next, whereas Norman. Yeah, can can draw a card, or because he's a seeker, likely has lots of other ways to draw <laughs> several <laughs> cards or whatever. Um, yeah, I think he seems really strong. Uh, last thing before we move on to the signature cards, at least last thing for me, I'm sad that this is not worded in a way that works with Bob. Right, Bob can't play this because it's not in his hand. Mm, true, true. That 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 saddens me, but minor minor gripe. Yeah. yeah. All right, his uh, his 
signature is the oh boy li live live like a uh, hmm. louvre is is spelled similarly i'm and guessing you don't so pronounce the live, r yeah like, is, is it just live live guess, their bond yeah. Uh, okay, anyway, it, it's it's French, I guess. It's the Hyperborean Grimoire. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a two-cost asset that goes in a hand slot. It's an item, a relic, a tome, and it says uh, exhaust it as a fast ability to swap the top card of your deck with a card in your hand. Or exhaust it as another fast ability to commit the top card of your deck to an eligible skill test. Oh, okay, so this is ah, okay. uh, performed by an investigator at your location. So this kind of both answers that question yeah. and solves that uh, downside a little bit mm -hmm. of skill cards for him. And the top one can let you play the top card of your deck with Bob by putting it in your hand. True, yeah. yeah. Although I think yeah, that's true, yeah. And then I think in most of the time when Bob's not around, uh, the purpose is that this lets you choose what card gets the discount. Yeah. Right? Um... I'm actually not sure this is very good. <laughs> I mean, I think we found in, in our recent campaign that, like, seeker hand slots are very valuable. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, there's times when it's like, oh, yeah, deductions, like, on top of my deck, it would be nice to have this. But, like, would you rather just spend an action to draw that deduction rather than committing your hand slot to this? Yeah. And maybe his hand slots aren't as valuable as they normally are for Seekers because he's becoming a Mystic over time and hand slots are not that important to Mystics. I don't think I can... But he still has five intellect. So, like, even, yeah. even in the last scenario of a campaign, him with, like, a Mad Glass is a pretty good investigator. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah, so... I don't know. I think that this could be... It's been a while, like... When you look back at the core set in Dunwich, there are a lot of investigators with signature cards that are like, well, it's good this has good icons because <laughs> you're probably not going to play it very often. Uh, and this, I wonder if this is kind of like those, um, that's, that's in, in more recent times, signatures have been very core to the way an investigator functions. And this yeah. feels more like the old school, like, eh, you might play it, but yeah. I mean, it also has great icons as exactly. long as you're running some Mystic cards that yeah. you might want willpower, or or as long as he draws treacheries, which everyone does. I've only played him with his uh, alternate signatures because uh -huh. that's what was released earlier, and like that was that was also a very similar card um, that could like change what was on top of the deck, and it was also one that you never actually played, so yeah. it seems very similar here. Okay, what's uh what's his weakness? So the weakness is the Harbinger. It's like a space hand. Yeah, um, that's it's cool. <laughs> an omen of the end times. Revelation. Place this card on top of your deck. While the Harbinger is revealed and on top of your deck, cards in your deck cannot be searched, drawn, or manipulated in any way except mm. by the blow ability. Um, so, yeah, so you can't even draw. And then yeah. for two actions, discard the Harbinger. This ability may be activated while the Harbinger is on top of your deck as if only your threat area. Hmm. So it's it's a it's a quite mandatory two action tax. Yeah. Right. Like, like unless this, it's like this the doesn't last kill time. you. Yeah. You got you, You're gonna have to spend two action because you're not gonna get even your like upkeep phase draws as long as this is yeah. there, right? And a lot of the things that you're trying to do with Norman won't work. Yeah. But ultimately, it doesn't hurt. Like it doesn't do damage or horror. It's just an action tax you're not the one who should be tangled up with a lot of enemies, so you can probably just do it. This doesn't seem that bad to me. Yeah, it's it's not too bad. Um the two the two action tax is pretty annoying. I um so his signature his other weakness, the one that we've been playing the with the last one, couple yeah, of years, yeah. was uh I think a two health enemy. Right. And I loved that weakness. Because this was also what before Mr. Rook was tabooed. Um, and so you could just uh, Mr. Rook to find the weakness um, as you were doing a Storm of Spirits. And it was like a free weakness. <laughs> um, so oh, wow. that, to me, that was like one of the easiest weaknesses in the game. That's funny. Um, and yeah. in fact, I think it actually had a low fight. So it made your Storm of Spirits easier. Because oh, you, now, like, you could target that you could target the yeah. lowest fight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I love that weakness. Like compared to that, this is annoying. But um, Funny. but it's not that bad. No. Yeah. I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's that bad at all. Um, which is pro you know, which is good because I don't think his signature yeah. really has it is that good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's nice to see that balance there. <laughs> um. All right. That brings us to the end of the investigators. Any 
Any like thoughts now that we've seen them all before we call this a video? Uh, I think I am most excited uh, by Bob because like you, I like the support and then Lily because mm -hmm. I'm really curious. She seems like she has the most options with all those disciplines. Yeah, I think I had a group, well, like I'm excited for Daniela because I, I played her once and liked her a lot and I'm a big Guardian fan. Uh, but I agree, I think Bob is the most exciting just because of what he does to both the way you consider your turn-by-turn -turn gameplay and the way your, your group builds their decks mm. is really turned on its head, or uh, turned on its head, but really affected by Bob being on the team in, a, in an exciting way. Um, that I think would be, at least in like a three or more player game, would be very strong mm -hmm. to, to get everyone their assets, everyone else can build less econ into their decks, and uh, whether that means running more skill cards or well, definitely more items, um, I think it's going to be for the better. I think they'll have better decks for not having to worry about that. Uh, seems, seems really good. Um, any thoughts on the deck building? How, how do you like all the overall the one investigator evolves from one class into the other? I, I like it as a mechanic. I think I slightly prefer the cycles where the investigators have different deck building styles. Yeah, this is the first time since Dunwich, right? That they've been like this uniform uh -huh. uh, model. I agree. I think that after about the second, like I remember when Norman came out in the book, it was really cool and everyone speculated and was really excited about like, it's funny because everyone assumed that there would be like, and I think his book came out in like the Dunwich era when yeah. everyone had been, every investigator so far had been released in cycles of, of sim similar deck building characteristics. And so everyone assumed like, oh, this will be a cycle of ones that work like this. And then so many years went by where that was no longer the case that I stopped assuming that. And then it turned out that assumption was right. <laughs> um, but overall, I don't, I don't know. It makes it really un, unclear what these characters should be doing. I guess maybe this is, maybe this is a bad thing to me when I'm sitting here uh, in a in front of a camera trying to talk about them. Maybe it's a good thing when you're like looking for yeah. challenging deck building you know, ch deck building challenges and things. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty torn on it. I don't know. Um, all right. Well, uh, thanks, Stephen, for, for talking through these with me. I think uh, we're recording a few more of these today, and you will see more of them over the coming weeks. So make sure to, uh, to like and subscribe. And um, yeah, you know, I said like and subscribe, so I think that's the end of the video. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a good uh, parting thought here. So um, until our next one, be optimal.